Well, good morning again. Um, just, I want to take a moment, just say thank you. You know, we go through this Pastor Appreciation Month thing, which I'm pretty much appreciated every month by the people in my life. I mean, what's there not to appreciate? But, um, <laughs> but anyways, I, I do want to say thank you, especially to a few people this morning. Like, I have the greatest staff that I serve with, um, all women except for Pastor Steve, so it's not an easy life, but <laughs> no, they're all great, and they do so much. It's unbelievable, but we also have a few other pastors in this church that we don't really celebrate. Uh, Pastor Pete down here, he's uh, such an encourager. Uh, Pastor Teresa Ramsey, again, such an encourager, and they do such great things around here, and I just, I just want to take a moment and thank them and celebrate them as well. <laughs> and now let's get to the Word of God this morning. We, we've been on an extensive journey together, and in the first part of this journey that we're on is, a, is, is about one thing, that we would learn the practice of being with Jesus, being with Jesus being with Jesus so that he can form our hearts, intentionally setting aside time where we can connect with Jesus and make Jesus our home, and he can make his home inside of us. Right now, as part of this journey of being with Jesus, we're discovering things about Jesus. Jesus makes what we call I am statements, all in the book of John, but, but they're statements declaring who he is, so that we can understand who it is that we are being with. For instance, a couple weeks ago, we studied how Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branch. And he, then he says, abide in me. And what Jesus is saying is, I am the source of your life. I will supply what you need in life. If, if you will be with me, my flow of who I am will come into you. Last week, we looked at the statement, I am the good shepherd. And this is Jesus saying, I am your leader. I will take care of you. I will watch over you. I'll protect you. I'll provide for you. And so when we are with Jesus, we are allowing him to lead us to things and through things. When we spend time with Jesus, intentionally making that time, something happens to us and we are formed into a different kind of human being. I can testify on my own behalf. You know, I'm a very different person than I was many, many years ago, and it's because of Jesus. Well, this morning, I want to talk to you about probably one of the more difficult, for me anyways, state I am statements that Jesus makes. But with audacity and with authority, Jesus, in this passage today, in John chapter 11, is going to declare this, I am the resurrection and the life. And when Jesus says this, he's, he's saying, I am not a religion. I am not a set of beliefs, but I am the death defeater and I am a life giver. I am the resurrection and I am the life. When he says resurrection, he's saying and declaring that he has power over death. That death is no longer the undefeated enemy in this world. Death is now, by his power, the door into the next life. He's saying that death is no longer permanent. The finality of death is over. The fear of death is over. Death no longer wins for those who trust Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean death doesn't hurt, but its crushing power is over forever. But he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He is life. He is a new life. The life that he gives is the pinnacle of what it means to be alive. Him living in us, us living in him, his life given for us. And when he takes up residence in our life, when we invite him to do that, when we become his follower, we become alive in a brand new way. We'll talk about this more next week. But we are now spirit invaded. This little slum that I lived in is now like a spirit invaded temple. You know, we, we who follow Jesus, we're not zombies just walking around. We have life, a new life inside of us, an undeniable rebirth. Something has happened. 
Well, what we're going to look at today in this passage in John chapter 11 is Jesus coming sort of in the, in the way of some of the great Old Testament stories. Remember some of the great Old Testament contests, David and Goliath, Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Well, this is sort of Jesus' moment. He's going to have a contest. He's going to face death, and we're going to see what he can do about it. He's going to show God's power over death. But this story today, it's about death. It's about the aftermath of a funeral. There's lots of emotions in it. And there's some people that you should know about, you probably do know about. Lazarus, he's the one who dies in this story. He has two sisters, Martha and Mary. They are grief-stricken and shocked over his death. These people, all of them, are very close friends to Jesus. So in this passage today, and we're going to sort of look at this passage briefly because it's a lot of details, but we want to hit the high points. But we want to go back with Jesus as he walks into this dark moment of the death of Lazarus and does one of what becomes one of the greatest signs in the ministry of Jesus that authenticates who he is to the people. So the story begins like this, John 11, verse 1. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus's sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Now, verse 4 there is very important, this whole thing about receiving glory. Because Lazarus is going to die, but Jesus is going to reverse his death. But what's important here is that Jesus is saying, this very moment, this very tragedy, is a moment for me and my Father to show some glory off. Jesus is going to walk into a tragedy and he's going to get some glory. He's going to show off some glory. Now, everybody at the end of this story is going to see a little bit of God's greatness. And they're all going to stand in awe and it's going to be like, glory, that is a bit of God's glory right there, what we just saw. We'll come back to the glory thing in a minute, though. Let's go on with the story. I'm going to pick it up at verse 17. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. Stop for a moment. Jesus walks into an all-too-familiar scene. It's, It's a death scene. Death is the great wrecking ball that destroys everything, It begins to shake out of us the biggest questions of the human heart. Questions about faith. What do we believe? Who is God? What is this life all about? Death is always messy. It's always violent. It's always heartbreaking. Death is unchosen separation from people we love. Death is never comfortable. We never know what to do about it. We never know what to say at a funeral home. We're just very uncomfortable about death. But we all know It's going to happen to us. And not only that, but there's a great fear about death and what happens after death. I've been at a lot of death scenes in my life. I have been at the bed of saints of God who walked triumphantly to their death, and we rejoiced when it happened. But I've been at the deathbed of rebellious sinners who were like, no, I'm not giving in to God, all the way to to death. I've been in funeral homes where the weeping was inconsolable because there was no hope. I've also been at funerals of all things that happened, but funerals where people kept coming up to the casket and putting in alcohol and cigarettes so that they could take them to the next life with them. I've conducted funerals that were full of laughter and tears because there was assurance beyond the grave, that this person was with the Lord. I've been at the death of people who were old, people who were middle-aged cancer victims, 
I've been at the deaths of tragic suicide victims, teenagers who were robbed of their life, children and babies who were gone way before they even got a chance to live. I've been at funerals where families came together in love. I've been at funerals where the drama in families was so ugly and prevalent. I've, I, I definitely have seen a vast difference between a funeral of somebody that knows Jesus and somebody who doesn't. It's a world of difference. But f- by far, of course, the worst death I've ever faced was the death of my late wife, Nancy, who unexpectedly went from waiting for a procedure to happen to being on life support within a matter of hours. And then watching her slip away from us, even while some of you were praying that God would heal her. But as she slipped away and we, my kids and I, gathered around her, that will be forever one of my worst memories. And in those moments of death, we gather, just like Mary and Martha in this story, we come together to express our support and our outrage at what happened, and our dismay at the moment. We come together to hold one another up and bring whatever comfort we can bring. But death is the unwelcome intruder in this world. It was never part of God's plan. And Jesus now is saying, I'm coming to do something about it. So the story begins with the death of Lazarus, But we see that Martha, the one sister, now expresses a little disappointment in Jesus. Listen to the story, verse 20. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everybody else rises on the last day. Let's just stop again. Martha is is sort of veiling her anger a little bit. Like, if you would have been here, if you would have been here, Jesus, this wouldn't have happened. In grief, we call this bargaining. If only I would have done this. If only I wouldn't have said this. If only they would have gone to the doctor sooner. If only, if only, if only. And here Martha is playing the game of Jesus Jesus, somehow this is maybe some of your fault because you could have been here to do something about this. But in the same breath, Martha says, but I know you could do anything you want. And that's when Jesus sort of drops the bomb on her and says, hey, your brother's going to rise again. Now, there's a lot of things you should never say at a funeral, like he's in a better place or God just needed another angel. Never say that stuff. And it's almost like Jesus is saying something that he shouldn't be saying at this time. And Martha, you know, she's like, well, of course I know he's going to rise again on the last day, judgment day. But this is when Jesus then makes the incredible statement in verse 25. Jesus told her, I'm the resurrection and the life. Like, (laughs) I can raise anybody I want, anytime I want. I'm the resurrection and the life. And and then he goes on. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Jesus is so audacious. He's coming to them and he's claiming that he has power. He's giving them information they've never even heard before. He's saying, I have the power over death. The darkness of the grave cannot defeat me. And then he goes on, he says, and by the way, I give a life, a certain kind of life that never goes away. You get it now and it just keeps on going. And then he goes on to say, to get that life, you have to believe in me. Believing in Jesus does something to you now, and then it does something to you in the next life. And then Jesus says, oh, by the way, physical death is not going to end the life that I give you. That if you believe in me, you will never die. Your life is just going to continue on. I'm going to transport you from one moment to another moment. 
You're going to keep on going. And Jesus then says that I'm the resurrection, that I can do this. Only I could do this. The power of death has been broken. I have the final say over this man's death, not just today, but for all eternity. And I have power over your death and over my death and over everybody's death. And not only does he have power over your death, but he even has power over your body. He will bring that back out of the grave. He is the Lord over eternity. And now he's going to prove it with a miraculous sign. Now, listen, Jesus is either crazy for saying this or it's true. Like people who like to say Jesus was just a really great prophet. He was just a great man with great teachings. Listen, anybody that came to you and said, hey, believe in me and you'll never die, right then you're going to go, I don't care what you say you are. I don't care if 90% of what you say is true. Right there, you just disqualified yourself from ever teaching me again. Jesus is either either crazy for saying this or he can actually pull it off. And this is a good time to stop for a moment and say, let's remember that what we believe as Christians, we are, this Christianity is a supernatural religion. We believe in the supernatural. We believe in something way beyond us. We have deep inner conviction that this is true. Jesus can pull this kind of stuff off. You know, when somebody passes away, we look for comfort wherever we can find it. Sometimes we are, I was like this, sometimes you're looking for a sign beyond the grave. Like, oh, I just want to know one more time, like, is she okay? Is she in your arms, Jesus? This is just natural that we want to do this. And I know some people, you know, like they find a feather in a crazy spot and they go, oh, look, You know, this is a sign from up above that she's all right or he's okay. And every time we find a feather after that, it becomes a sign to us. And I I guess there's nothing wrong with that. But I want to take you to something better. When Jesus, or or I I should say this, when Nancy passed away, I, I, I came to this conclusion, I don't need a sign. The only sign I needed was this. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. That's the only sign you need right there. He said it, he'll do it. You know, every major religion in this world has a death story. Like Buddhists and Hindus, they believe in karma. What's karma? It's an endless cycle of reincarnation. You keep being sent back into this world over and over again until you get it right. And the possibility is you're never going to get it right. So you just come back, maybe better, maybe you come back worse, or maybe you come back as the stray cat in your neighborhood. I mean, that could be your cousin walking around. But you keep coming back until you get it right. And who decides if you get it right? It's, that's, who knows? But I want to tell you, that's a ra- rather hopeless scenario. I don't see how it brings any comfort to anybody. Like, you're never going to get it right. Muslims, they believe that there's no way to know whether you're going to end up in paradise or in hell. It's up to Allah, and you better catch Allah on a good day. Muhammad himself, the founder of Islam, didn't even know if he was going to be in heaven or hell. It all depended on Allah and if he did enough good works. Many people have a form of this. It's called, you know, good works. Like, in the end, God's going to weigh my good works on one side, my bad works on the other. Let's just hope those outweigh that. But when do you know when you've done enough good? You never know if you've done enough good. My own grandmother, who was a godly woman, told me one day, I don't know if I'm going to heaven or hell. I just don't know. She had no assurance. The atheists, they have a death story. Their death story is there's no existence after life. You came into this life unconscious, you'll leave unconscious, and that's it. So when Jesus arrives, he says, well, let me tell you my death story. I'm the resurrection and the life, and I know what's beyond the grave, and I have power over the grave, and by the way, I'm going to resurrect you one day, and, and then you will have life forever after the grave. In John chapter 5, he actually says that all the dead are going to hear his voice one day and they're going to be raised for good or for bad. But Jesus is declaring, I'm the Lord over this life. I'm the Lord over the next life. I control death. And that if you believe in me, you will have life now and that life will just keep on going. 
And you can know for sure, this, this is the best part, you can know for sure that you are going to be with Jesus in that next life. You can be released from the fear of death, your fear of your death, the fear of somebody else's death. You can be released from it. I like that story. When I die, if any of you are around for that moment, I want you to know I'm going to be with Jesus. Where I'm going to be. Let's go back to the verse again, verse 25. Jesus told her, Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I've always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. I mean, Jesus just asked Martha flat out, do you believe what I'm saying? Jesus asked us out flat out today, do you believe this? Do you believe I can do this for you? Now, Martha's response is a great response because her mind is getting blown at this moment. Like, I don't even know what you're talking about. What are you talking about raising my, my brother up from the dead? There's not even a category in my life for that. I, I don't know. But, but she does respond and say, I don't understand everything, but I know only one thing. You are the Son of God. You're the Messiah, and you can do whatever you want. If you don't know what to believe, just start right there. Jesus, I don't even know what's going on, but you, I believe in you. Jesus steps into this tragic scene, and basically he's telling Martha right now, Martha, I'm here. You need to expect more. You need to expect more out of me. You need to have a little more faith in this because Jesus has explained to her that he has no boundaries, he has no fence, no limitations. Time doesn't limit him. Space doesn't limit him. Culture doesn't limit him. Evil power doesn't limit him. Ignorance doesn't limit him. The past doesn't limit him. The future doesn't limit him. Nothing can limit Jesus. So expect more. Now what happens next in this story happens at every funeral. But Jesus now, you know, at this point in the story, Mar Mary's come along, and, and uh, when the people see Mary come out to Jesus, they come out after her weeping and crying. And here's what happens, verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him. What is he angry about? He's angry at death and its destruction. A deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him? But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? I know that I didn't used to cry at a lot of funerals, until I had to have one of my own. And then I realized just how much it hurts. Jesus is fully engaged at this moment. He is weeping with this family as he's preparing to square off against death. Verse 38, Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. A cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll away the stone, he says. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been in there, dead. he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. The King James Version says, he stinketh, which is a classic verse of the Bible. <laughs> but it's still nothing but unbelief. Like, what are you doing? Why do we need to roll away the stone? And Jesus, you know, it's like, roll it away if you want to see my glory. And this is what happens Verse 40, Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? All he asked him to do was roll away the stone. Just do it. So they rolled the stone, aside. They rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and he said, and this is the craziest prayer of all time. He says, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of all those people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. I mean, what kind of prayer is that? Like, Jesus, I'm just saying this so everybody knows that I'm talking to you. 
I'm not even asking you anything. I just want them to know that we're in this together. And then in verse 43, Jesus shouts, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out. His hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. All this tension builds up to this last moment when Jesus just simply commands Lazarus to walk. He doesn't even pray about it. He just says, come out. Now, why could Jesus do this? Because he's the resurrection and the life. Why can't you do it? Because you're not the resurrection and the life. You can't just command these things to happen. He can. And out comes Lazarus, shuffling along. What a testimony he must have given in that synagogue the next week. Let me just tell you what I saw, you know. But that, this is one of the reasons I love that song that we sing. When he called my name, I ran out of that grave. I just want to finish this with four small application points. Because in this series, we're talking about being with Jesus. When you are with Jesus, several things are going to happen that we see in this story. Number one, God's glory is going to blow your mind. What is God's glory? God's glory is God showing up in God ways. Glory is when God pulls back the curtain just a little bit and he says to you, I'm telling you who I am today because the only way that this happens today is if I do it. That's glory. That's when we stand back and say, "Woo, God showed up. And when glory comes, it leaves you astounded. Now, when they looked at Jesus in John chapter 1, do you remember what they said? Oh, he's got glory. Jesus got glory. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul says that when you see his glory, it'll transform you. You'll get a little piece of glory in you. Some of you need some glory in you. I need more glory in me. But when you see his glory, you, you can't keep thinking small. And when you see his glory, you can't keep praying small. And when you see his glory, you're going to stop wrestling with these petty little things that we're all bent out of shape about. Jesus wants you to see his glory. And when you see his glory, boom, you'll have a new mental map of how to handle things in life. Here's the second point. Jesus has powers that are not of this world. His power doesn't come from this world. His power is not subject to this world. In fact, his power is out of this world. When we call upon the name of Jesus... We are asking Jesus to act, not according to our ability, but according to his ability. We are asking him to do things that only he can do, things that are above and beyond the laws of nature. It's above and beyond the opposition of human beings. It's above and beyond even hell. Jesus commands angels. He commands atoms. He commands the weather. He commands the government. He commands everything. Whatever he wants to command, he does it to get his will done because he's a resurrection and the life. Number three, Jesus feels us. In this story, Jesus feels the full of effects of what, it, what it's like to live on the planet Earth. He weeps with this family because he feels it. He gets frustrated over the unbelief. He's angry because he's facing death. He even gets exasperated that nobody really understands the moment that is about to happen. But Jesus feels our sorrow, our pain, our regrets, our troubles, our burdens, our anxieties. He feels every one of them, and he shows up in them. And the last point is this. Now you know. Now you know how amazing Jesus is. Now you know what he can do. Now you know that death doesn't have the last word. Now you know that there's a life beyond this life. Now you know that Jesus can move when nobody believes that he can move. Now you know that Jesus loves you. Now you know that Jesus walks with you. Now you know that Jesus cares for his people. Now you know what you can expect of Jesus. Now you know that Jesus 
wants to show off every once in a while. Now you know that when Jesus speaks, everything jumps to do what he commands it to do. Now you know that when it's hard to believe, just keep believing in Jesus. Now you know to expect more. Now you know to invite Jesus into your deepest hurt. Now you know who Jesus is and that he doesn't operate under the same set of rules that all of us operate under. Now you know that the next funeral you go to, don't say something weird. (laughs) Now you know that death isn't the end. Now you know that Jesus has no limits. So Jesus wins the contest. If he can win this contest, what can't he do? He has power over death. He has power over demons, over depression, over disease. He has power over the prison doors, the funeral stones. He has power over whatever's captivated you. He has power over addiction, strongholds, footholds, night terrors, day anxieties. He has power over your spouse, your children's hearts, your mistakes, your sins, your regrets, your guilt, and your crushed dreams. I mean, on this day, death knelt down and said, I give up, Jesus. Take him back. Man. When Jesus walks into the room, everything else is going to do the same. Ah, take it. Take it, Jesus. You win. You win. I used to fight my uncles, and, you know, they'd make you say, say uncle, say uncle. And uh, I'd say, always say uncle because they were stronger. Well, here, it's death crying out, uncle, uncle, because Jesus is great. Now you know why you want to be with Jesus and get a little bit of this glory in your life. Let's stand. Maybe you want to spend a little time this morning kneeling before Jesus or just closing your eye where you are. Be with him right now. Lord, we want to be with you. Lord, we all, I think everybody in this room needs to see a little bit of your glory. Our heads have been looking down, but you want us to look up. Our hearts have been clouded with problems, unbelief. And here, you've walked into the room today, and we can't even see you. Lord, lift our eyes up. Lift our eyes up that we can get a glimpse of your glory. Our hearts will be flooded with your light. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, Father, come. Touch your people. Following Jesus in baptism is not just an option, it's commanded by Jesus to show the world who is living in your heart. You are testifying about your faith in Jesus Christ. We have baptism coming up on November 17th in the Sunday morning service. If you have never been baptized, please contact us because we would like to get you in the water and get you under the water and get you out of the water to show your faith in Jesus Christ. Riverside is happy to partner with Angel Tree and information can be obtained in the church lobby. Here are some holiday season key dates. November 28th, the church office will be closed for Thanksgiving. December 22nd, there is a River Kids musical during the second service and a birthday party for Jesus afterwards. On December 24th, you're invited to join us for our Christmas Eve service starting at 6 p.m. On December 29th, we will have one service at 10.30 a.m. January 5th is Communion Sunday. Stay updated on life groups, volunteer opportunities, and more via the website, app, and social media. Bring the family to our kids production on December 22nd during the second service at 1030. River Kids will showcase their hard work in a heartwarming performance. Afterward, join us for a birthday party for Jesus in the Fellowship Hall. If you have been participating in Operation Christmas Child, then you have already done a box and brought it back to the church. We are going to be packing up all of these boxes and boxes from all around the community from November 18th to 25th. They will bring them to our church. We will sign them in. We will pray over those boxes and then we're going to put them in bigger boxes and then ship them out. 
If you could take a turn, one of those days or nights of that week, we would love for you to sign up and be a part of the bigger part of Operation Christmas Child.